Hey guys, my name is Joel Ham. I'm a emergency medicine physician at University of Kentucky. Um, I've had some tropical medicine uh, training, so I thought this would be a really interesting talk for you all. Um, so I've done the uh, Gorgas course in Peru, so some South American training. And then a couple of years ago, I went to um, Southeast Asia and did a course I'll talk about at the end that's uh, really cool for learning this material. So um, I'll show you. So this was some of our cuisine, <laughs> not really, but, uh, but this was uh, offered uh, kind of on the street markets. Uh, if you see here to the left, and this was one of our emergency departments in Cambodia that we visited. So I don't have any financial disclosures. Uh, these are the things I'll be talking about. So some epidemiology of tropical medicine in Asia, emergent and critical care, which is what I really wanna focus on, uh, especially emergent medical care in Asia regarding to tropical diseases. Um, some geographically isolated diseases that are kind of interesting to know about and maybe worth uh, knowing about for diagnostic purposes. Uh, snake bites are a big problem, obviously, in Asia, so we'll talk a little bit about that as well. And then uh, we'll talk uh, briefly about the uh, Japanese encephalitis uh, virus uh, vaccine. So, I mean, yeah, each country could have their own talk on tropical medicine and then many more beyond that. So this is a very broad overview of the whole process. Um, I'll just kind of um, you know, point out that things may be very different in Northern Asia compared to India, compared to Southeast Asia, um, to the Middle East. So there are a lot of uh, different um, geographically uh, unique areas. Some of the epidemiology, and I just picked four regions um, to talk about. So Yemen um, has uh, a pretty high burden of schistosomiasis, which was kind of interesting. Uh, mostly schisto um, menzoni on that one. Uh, the, uh, and you also have the intestinal uh, helminth uh, Hel infections, like the worm infection, ascaris, and um, so can be common. Some of the eye infections like onchocerciasis and trachoma, I didn't realize were in this area of the Middle East. And then they do uh, get cutaneous leishmaniasis there as well, um, which is actually pretty common in like the mid Asian um, areas as well, like Afghanistan and Pakistan and things. So dengue, we'll talk about is a worldwide problem. India. So people uh, who've worked in India and are from India describe India as a place where you can basically uh, see any type of disease. So they have a very uh, diverse uh, geography. And uh, as you can see here, a lot of high burden of uh, infectious diseases ranging from um, ascaris, hookworm, uh, dengue, obviously, and then rabies actually is unfortunately not uh, super uncommon in uh, India. Uh, visceral leishmaniasis is an interesting uh, disease as well that's relatively common there. China. So China, uh, we've got the um, the uh, the high burden of the helmet infections there. You see hookworm, whipworm, ascaris, uh, pretty high burden. And then you also see paragonimus um, and uh, clonorca, so the, some of the liver flukes and then uh, schistosomiasis as well. And they've got some numbers here on neglected diseases in the United States as well on that paper. And then Southeast Asia, which is where I, most of my experience comes from, uh, you'll see the helminth infections are also very high. Uh, dengue fever, very common in Southeast Asia. There's actually clinics that are set up just to treat dengue. Uh, and then you also notice uh, malaria is common and um, the flukes and schisto as well. So that's just some basic overview of the epidemiology in different regions of Asia. This is where I spent um, several weeks um, studying tropical medicine disease, the Mahida uh, University in uh, Bangkok. And we spent time in Cambodia as well. This is a a um, list of prices for emergency uh, procedures in, um, 
uh, as well uh, that's kind of listed on the front of the door that you guys would see that sometimes in uh, low resource settings. Emergent critical care in Asia. So this is why I really want to talk about a lot of uh, interesting things that if you weren't aware about it and you just treated things like we do here in the United States, uh, you may um, not be treating the disease uh, well enough. So malaria in Asia, we'll talk about, we'll talk about dengue hemorrhagic fever. Melodosis, uh, something we don't see here, but uh, very common in Southeast Asia, as is scrub typhus, a rickettsial disease. Leptos, leptospirosis, I'm talking about, as well as typhoid fever and murine typhus. These are worldwide diseases, but they have a high burden of disease in Southeast Asia, especially in India. Uh, so they're just important to talk about because there's things that we don't necessarily have on our differential here in the United States, but uh, in these settings, they would be um, very common. And then I'll briefly talk about some of the um, parasites that can cause eosinophilic meningitis. Remember your broad differential. So you're in a low resource setting. There are a lot of other things that could be um, contributing to the disease. So don't just get fixated on the um, or anchored on the um, disease of the um, uh, that you're learning about. You know, keep a broad differential in in Asia for sure. So this was a study in, in Laos. Uh, the um, non malaria causes of fever. Uh, obviously, malaria is going to be the highest, but I want to draw your attention here to um, dengue fever being 20%. Um, and then you look down scrub typhus. So if you're in this country or region, that's actually going to be pretty high, um, you know. And then uh, this um, uh, flu was actually lower than scrub typhus or dengue, which is interesting. And then it's right there with Japanese encephalitis virus, which oftentimes causes a milder disease. Uh, but it can obviously be severe. And marine typhus is on here as well. So just be aware that there are a lot of causes of fever um, that may not be on our differential in these countries. So some comments on malaria in Asia. So falsa parent arm, uh, obviously very uh, high burden of disease worldwide, uh, especially in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, less uh, common actually than Vivax in Asia. Vivax is more common and there is um, spreading resistance, especially to the artesanate uh, uh, derivatives of um, uh, the drugs, that are our best drugs against malaria. So there is resistance developing to falciparum. Uh, Ovali is actually in Southeast Asia as well. We typically think of it as a West African disease, but there is, it is in Southeast Asia. And then malaria, so malaria and no lessi. So no lessi is a um, it's a uh, it's, it's a a variant of malaria that is common in uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, and it's rapidly fatal. I'll talk about it for a minute here. Um, but it's often misdiagnosed as malaria, which tends to be a milder form of the disease. Um, so just be aware of that if you work in these areas. This is uh, Vivax, uh, the epi uh, epidemiology of it. And as you can see, there's very high burden, especially in the um, Indonesia, Malaysia, kind of um, the island countries here, uh, also in Thailand. Um, and you go over to Brazil as well. Uh, there's, some, there's some pockets, but just be aware that this is a, a very high burden in Southeast Asia. No lessi I'll talk about. Um, so this is um, not often talked about in um, in courses, but it is a Southeast Asia uh, variant of malaria, and it's um, most common in Malaysia. Uh, it causes severe disease. So that's probably the most important thing, that it can be rapidly fatal. And this is mainly because it has a very short um, life cycle, so the RBCs can reproduce uh, very quickly and cause um, high parasitemia, whereas um, falciparum, uh, you know, it can take three to four days to, to reproduce. So no less, he has severe complications and high fatality rate. Uh, thankfully, it isn't uh, resistant to chloroquine yet. So this would actually be one where you, if you do have an, a diagnosis and you're not worried about a co-contamination, 
or um, co-infection, then you may consider giving chloroquine here. Uh, there is malaria resistance that is emerging in Southeast Asia, which tends to be uh, interesting, the area that uh, resistance develops most often for malaria. Uh, chloroquine uh, a resistant falciparum developed in Southeast Asia in the 1950s. Unfortunately, we've got the artesanate uh, 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 resistance developing too, uh, to falciparum, which is a big deal. And then we've got the um, chloroquine resistant P. vivax. So that's a new development as well. P. vivax used to be sensitive to chloroquine, so you could treat it with that. Um, it appears that there is some resistance developing in Southeast Asia. Other drugs like um, methylquine has resistance developing too uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, dengue. So that was uh, malaria in Asia. So now we'll talk about dengue, uh, a huge burden of disease in Southeast Asia. Uh, it's considered a neglected tropical disease despite having such a burden, high burden of disease. So uh, most of the burden is in this region in the Western Pacific and Southeast Asia. So what I'll talk to you guys about is dengue hemorrhagic fever. Uh, so this is when you get very sick and critical with dengue. Uh, there's this incubation period of four to seven days, but only up to 14 days. So if someone develops fever, that's important because if someone develops fever after coming home, but it's been over two weeks um, since they uh, arrived, when they develop the symptoms, it can't be dengue. So just keep that in mind that you really do need that 14 day window. Uh, for the hemorrhagic fever, uh, which is less common, you do get the severe plasma leakage, shock, ARDS, uh, and then the, the severe bleeding is the other thing that we'll talk about. This is a grant image of the epidemiology of um, dengue. This is from the WHO. The dengue tends to be a seasonal disease, um, and you'll see that um, in different seasons, the uh, the, the disease uh, will uh, be more common. So this is important with dengue, something to keep in mind. We've got these warning signs. Uh, so you've got um, abdominal pain, persistent vomiting, bleeding from the low platelets and then hepatosplenomegaly. They also talk about a rising hematocrit with a dropping of the platelets with dengue during the critical uh, phase. And eventually, if, um, if you have enough plasma leakage, you will develop shock and respiratory stress, ARDS, um, and also bleeding. This is the time course for dengue. So you'll notice um, temperature, tends to be very high early in the disease. Uh, the potential clinical issues, so you'll see in the critical phase is when you develop the shock and bleeding, and then you get the fluid um, uh, at the, uh, the fluid uh, plasma leakage at the end, so. All right, and then you've got the um, uh, rising hematocrit, so, um, as well as the dropping in the platelets are your laboratory uh, changes. And then you've got the, um, uh, your diagnosis is PCR early on, but then you will get the antibodies developed. And they have the rapid test now too with dengue. So that's the, that's the time portion. So Shaw and uh, colleagues have looked at dengue and ultrasound, point of care ultrasound. They've shown that uh, when there's fluid and uh, there's a pericholecystic fluid that develops around the gallbladder, um, these are findings in uh, severe dengue. So it's just something to keep an eye on. Uh, there's probably room for research in this as well moving forward. And I won't go through all this, but basically this is uh, from the WHO and how um, you'll treat the severe bleeding uh, and also the, um, the, sh the uh, third spacing from the uh, plasma leakage. So dengue, they talk about um, 
white islands on the sea of red so you'll see from this picture um clinical picture that um you'll have that and then um they also do develop rhabdo sometimes and you'll see the um, the release of the hemoglobin urea which will cause like a reddish brown uh urine so that's a picture there so we talked about severe malaria and uh, dengue hemorrhagic fever. Meloidosis is a, tends to be more geographically isolated disease to Southeast Asia. Uh, you'll notice here that it is in this area and also Northern Australia. It is a disease uh, caused by Burkholderia pseudomalae, um, gram negative bacteremia. And you can see the risk factors there tend to be immunosuppression. Untreated, you're looking at 10 to 40 percent um, mortality and septic shock. So the big point here that the, the uh, drug of choice is ceftazidine and second line is meropenem. So it's resistant to a lot of common antibiotics, ciprofloxacin, cetraxone. Uh, so if you're in these areas and you suspect this, and it is only diagnosed by blood cultures, um, so you'd probably be treating the septic shock early. You probably want to start with the ceftaz if you have that, and they actually do that in these areas. Uh, so it can lead to big abscesses and septic uh, sepsis, so just a sick disease, meloidosis. Scrub typhus, so a rickettsial disease uh, common in Southeast Asia. Um, there will be an eschar sometimes, but it's not, um, it's path more pathognomonic if you see it, but uh, it doesn't rule out the disease if you don't see it. So uh, it's transmitted by a mite, and you get the classic like fever, headache, and an SCAR if in classic diseases. Uh, remember, they can get shock as well, meningitis. Treatment's doxy. So, um, you know, like a lot of tropical medicine diseases, adding doxy um, can be helpful. And diagnosis by serology and PCR. We'll talk briefly about typhoid fever. So, Salmonella typhi is a worldwide disease, but it's very common in. Uh, India especially, uh, you get the prolonged fever up to five weeks. Um, rose spots uh, with typhoid, you tend to be leukopenic with the left shift. I'll show you with leptospirosis, you tend to have a high white count. Uh, this is a diagnosed by cultures as well. Uh, there's a white old test that you may see in low resource settings. Remember that's not specific or sensitive. Um, in Kenya, we would use that a lot, but um, again, it's not a very good test and uh, treatment of typhoid is Cipro or Azithro generally. And there's the worldwide distribution you'll see, um, especially in countries like uh, Pakistan, Nepal, um, there may be high, um, high burden of disease. Marine typhus, I'll talk about briefly. So it's um, a rickettsial typhus. You'll get a fever, rash, and headache, kind of a classic triad there of the rickettsial diseases. Uh, it's common in Southeast Asia, transmitted by a flea carried by rats. So it's a disease of poverty. It's common in Southeast Asia, but I'd say it's also a worldwide disease. Uh, this can be found in um, all areas of poverty. A diagnosis is serology and uh, treatment is doxy or azithro. Leptospirosis, um, another grant image here showing the kind of the worldwide distribution of leptospirosis. It, it is an uh, interesting disease in that it's a spirochete uh, spread by uh, rodents, uh, often associated with water. Um, so if you ever have an ID a doc asking like any water exposure, this is one of the things on the differential. Um, so there's seasonal distribution of this, kind of like with den dengue. These these people can get really, really sick as well. And here's the kind of the, the global burden of morbidity and mortality, again, central, centered in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, Will's disease is uh, a common name for when leptospirosis gets bad. You'll see the classic triad of jaundice, uh, severe hemorrhage and uh, renal disease. And then the interesting thing with leptospirosis, the direct bilirubin tends to be very high, whereas with the viral um, hemorrhagic fevers like uh, yellow fever and um, 
the ones that affect the liver, uh, the, they'll have severe um, transaminitis, but may not have that really high direct delivery event. So it's just something that separates leptospirosis. You also get with leptospirosis like high uh, white count with the left shift and then very high mortality with this. Uh, treatment is just broad spectrum antibiotics. Ceftriaxone would work. Um, this is one where you you would you know it responds very well to treatment, um, but uh, without the antibiotics, there's high mortality. So this is something interesting: the idea of what's a broad spectrum antibiotic in uh, different countries, and it can a lot of it depends on the national. Um, availability and what they can provide. Uh, but just for coverage sakes, uh, some examples of broad spectrum antibiotics in uh, India, maybe um, salmonella type E, you would want ceftriaxone to cover um, uh, typhoid fever and leptospirosis. And then uh, doxy may be considered for coverage of scrub typhus. So I, would, I don't think I would think about adding the uh, doxy unless I knew that um, disease was prevalent. And then in Southeast Asia, we have the broad spectrum antibiotics um, consider uh, septazidine. So this would also be in Northern Australia, kind of the epidemiology area of melanoidosis. So you may also consider um, doxycycline for scrub typhus here as well. Uh, just a geographically isolated disease that's uh, interesting. So sarcocystosis, it's, you get rare outbreaks in Malaysia. Uh, it tends to have muscular involvement. So you'll be thinking about like a patient with like fever and severe muscle pain, ache. Then you may order SCK if you have one. They also have the high eosinophilia due to the uh, migration of the um, uh, uh, infection. The diagnosis is by muscular biopsy as well. So just an interesting disease. All right, so I know I like sushi. I, I'm sure all you guys uh, do as well, or at least know people that like sushi. So uh, just be careful, uh, especially if you're in other countries, if they don't handle the sushi properly, especially um, keeping it frozen is very important and cold temperatures and these um, parasites can develop. So things like uh, nathostoma, which I'll show you causes eosinophilic meningitis, is a common um, parasite that uh, is common in raw fish. Capillara philippinensis is a Philippine disease that causes um, caparella a disease, again, a common uh, from eating raw fish. Anisakis is a um, it's a common in sushi. It's often associated with that. It's like a gastro gastritis, severe gastritis disease. Diphylobotrium latum is uh, the largest um, uh, tapeworm, uh, and it's uh, associated with vitamin B12 deficiency. You may remember that one. And then paragonimus uh, from eating raw carb and clonorchus from eating uh or sorry, raw crab, clonorchus is from raw carp. So clonorchus is a liver fluke uh, that uh, these cultures that eat the raw carp can contract. Also remember, um, you know, all the, all the things, the viral causes um, of gastroenteritis, like hepatitis A, norovirus, astrovirus, calcivirus, and then uh, by bacterial causes that we think about as well, Arimonas and Vibrio and all, all the other ones that are probably more common. But uh, just be aware this is out there and um, definitely at risk. <laughs> so eosinophilic meningitis. So you wouldn't know that these were the cause until you get your um, um, your uh, LP results and nathostoma or angiostrongulus are causes. So these are common in Southeast Asia. Um, so just be aware that they're out there and uh, you'll have the high eosinophil count with these. Snake bites. So we'll talk briefly about snake bites. As you can see from uh, this map, the epidemiology is very high burden, especially in Asia. Uh, India, Southeast Asia, uh, very common uh, to have snake bites from 
pretty bad snakes. These are some of the culprits. So king cobras and crates tend to have more of a neurotoxin uh, release. And I'll talk a little bit about that. The hematotoxic uh, release of the Siamese wrestle vipers and the pit vipers, uh, more similar to what we see in the crotalids uh, or the um, uh, like the rattlesnakes and uh, copperhead families here. And then the myotoxins are caused by the uh, sea snakes in these countries. So snake bites, neurotoxin, uh, the clinical effects, you'll get uh, neurological effects so like ptosis, ophthalmoplegia, and dysphagia uh, from the king cobra bite or the crate bite. And then, uh, so one, one patient uh, we saw was a patient that was being ventilated from um, respiratory um, paralysis, uh, a young child. And so this is common in these countries, obviously. Um, you know, they developed antivenoms um, and hope that they will work and kick in uh, to uh, resolve the paralysis, especially in these young, young kids that are bit. So this was a snake farm. We went to the, these guys um, will uh, get the cobras and they uh, extract the venom into these cups. And as you can see in the picture here, the, the snake will bite the rubber cap and then uh, the venom will be extracted so that it can be reused um, and developed anti-venom. Uh, so these are pretty common. This is in Bangkok and uh, these guys are pretty brave to be doing this obviously, but, uh, but they seem to be enjoying their job uh, when I was there. And here's an example. Um, so they're trying to grab the snake head here and then you can see the anti-venom that they've collected here to the left on the screen. All right, we'll wrap up with Japanese encephalitis. So again, I showed you, you know, up to 15% um, of the cause of the causes of fever for Japanese encephalitis in these countries. It's the most common cause of viral encephalitis in Asia. So it's actually super common when you're there. Uh, there is like the milder form that you can develop, but then you can get the encephalitis with seizures and abnormal behavior, all the things that come with that encephalitis. Uh, incubation may be one to two weeks, so maybe someone goes to Southeast Asia, they come back to the United States, but they may not develop symptoms until a week or two after their return. So uh, it's just something to keep in mind on your differential when you see these patients here in the United States. It's transmitted by Culex. Uh, so remember, uh, basically dengue transmits is transmitted by Aedes uh, mosquitoes and then um, falciparum and um, yellow fever and so some others are transmitted by um, uh, the um, Anopheles uh, mosquito. So Culex, uh, we have them here as well, and, but um, we just don't have this disease to transmit. So you'll notice that they don't have their back part uh, elevated, um, whereas um, the uh, Aedes mosquitoes will have the elevated. And then also the Aedes has uh, like stripes on its legs. Culex tend to be a little bit bigger as well than Anopheles and um, Aedes mosquitoes. So it's got a really high uh, case mortality, 30%, and that's if untreated. So, so with that, you would definitely want to, uh, if you're going to these areas, you would want to get the vaccine. Actually, I haven't gotten this one, but uh, especially if you're going to be in a rural area for, you know, over a month, this would be something to consider a live attenuated vaccine. And um, it's 80% effective with one dose and then up to 97% effective with the, with the um, booster shot. So this was a course uh, that I participated in a couple years ago. They've actually got it up and running um, for this coming spring. Uh, it's typically in June, uh, but it's a couple of weeks long. You spend most of your time in Bangkok, um, working at Mahida University with worldwide like experts in tropical medicine in this uh, region. And then you go out to a uh, malaria um, station on the border with uh, Burma. 
Um, and then you also um, can go to uh, Siem Reap and Cambodia and go to Angkor Wat, which you can see in the background here um, on my uh, on my um, background. So uh, I'm not sure if these prices, I think these are up to date, but you just have to check the website. And then here's some of the things that, um, that we're on the schedule to talk about. So uh, obviously a lot of, um, a lot of good topics there with uh, Asian tropical medicine disease. So here are some of my references. Um, reach out if you have any questions about anything uh, and I wish you guys all the best in the rest of your studies. Thank you.